Some Experiences of the Supernormal by Alice Isaacson Published in The Occult Review, Volume 1, Number 5, May 1905 Without attempting in any way to explain the inexplicable and mysterious link that undoubtedly exists between the physical and spiritual worlds, or to theorize upon the why and wherefore of ghostly apparitions, the following absolutely true and well-authenticated incidents are recorded as being notable examples of supernormal experiences. Although less than 40 miles from London, Malling is one of those pleasant old country towns in the picturesque Garden of Kent that still preserve more than a suggestion of remoteness from the metropolis. The historic interest of the place centers in its ancient abbey. Founded in 1090 by Gundolf, Bishop of Rochester, Malling Abbey became the home of a community of Benedictine nuns, who rapidly increased in power and importance, making their influence felt for good amongst the children who came to be taught in their schools, and the sick and destitute who sought their kindly ministrations from far and near. It is a quaint illustration of feudal tenures under the Norman kings that the abbess of Malling held the abbey lands upon condition of sending annually to the Bishop of Rochester 10 pounds of wax gathered from the beehives in the convent garden, together with one wild boar acorn fattened from the woods surrounding the abbey. With the dissolution, the cloistered quiet of the nuns was rudely broken. They were dispersed abroad, and the abbey, shorn of a portion of its rich domains, was granted to Archbishop Cranmer. Through succeeding centuries, it suffered many vicissitudes, until such fragments as remained of the conventual buildings, together with the modern dwelling house that had risen phoenix-like amidst the ruins, were purchased by the Akers family, were eventually sold again to Miss Boyd, and through her instrumentality, reverted in some sense to their former purpose. For the Abbey precincts are now the property of and occupied by a Benedictine sisterhood in communion with the Anglican Church. There is but little trace of Bishop Gundolf's foundation. The cloisters with their broad trefoiled arches of a later date form part of the modern mansion. The chapter house, where the nuns were wont to meet in solemn conclave, has long been degraded to the domestic purposes of kitchen and scullery, while the former is, or was, paved in part with stone slabs from which the monumental brasses have disappeared. Adjoining the gatehouse is an old pilgrim's chapel, and this has been restored and re-consecrated for divine service. It is not astonishing that credulity and superstition should have woven traditions around a locality in whose past history reality and romance have been so strangely intermingled. And there was a time when Malling Abbey had the reputation of being haunted, when in fact, to quote the words of one who often stayed there, a man not given to imaginary terrors, it was reeking with ghosts. Stories were told of unlooked-for sights and unaccountable sounds, of impressions so vivid yet so curiously at variance with ordinary experience that they could be attributed only to supernatural agency. One incident in particular is vouched for by a lady as having occurred during her residence at the Abbey. On a certain summer night, she was aroused from sleep and felt impelled by an impulse she could not resist to rise from her bed and to draw aside the curtains of her window. The garden below was bathed in moonlight, and there, in the center of an open space, she saw distinctly a little group of ghostly figures garbed like nuns who were digging what appeared to be a grave. Even as she gazed upon the scene, the apparition vanished, but so deep was the impression it left upon her mind that the following day, she ordered the identical spot to be dug up in reality. Several feet beneath the surface of the ground, the remains of a female skeleton were found, with a nun's ring still encircling one bony finger. There was documentary evidence to prove that the spot was not, and never had been, the consecrated burial place of the long-dead Benedictine nuns, and one can but conjecture what had been the life story of that poor relic of humanity. Had she, like the frail vestal of ancient Rome, forsworn her vows and suffered the dread penalty of being interred alive? Who can tell? At any rate, the unhappy spirit must have been assoiled at last, for the bones were reverently gathered up and reinterred, and the phantom group of gravediggers was seen no more. Although the most appropriate environment for a ghost story is popularly supposed to be some feudal castle, historic mansion, or other ancient building 
with a traditionary past, it is by no means impossible for a modern dwelling house to be haunted, as the following incident, in which a personal friend of the writer was concerned, will testify. Mrs. C., the lady in question, lived with her husband in the early days of their married life in a village not many miles distant from Birkenhead, on the Cheshire side of the Mersey. Their house, which was small as befitted somewhat straightened means, was semi-detached and differed in no material respect from those of their neighbors. On either side of the front entrance were the drawing room and dining room. The latter was an ordinary apartment, not large, and with no specially distinctive feature. One day, not many months after Mrs. C. and her husband had settled in their new abode, the former, who had scarcely recovered from a tedious illness, was resting on a couch in the dining room, when quite suddenly she felt an instinctive sensation that she was not alone. She looked up, and to her amazement, saw a little man dressed in a light gray suit of clothes standing just inside the closed door. As she gazed at him for the moment speechless, wondering how such an intruder could possibly have entered the house and room unheard, for that it was an apparition did not at first occur to her. The figure moved slowly across the room towards the fireplace, taking no notice seemingly of her presence, rested an elbow on the mantelpiece, then turned and as it reached the door, disappeared. Released as from a spell, Mrs. C rushed out to interrogate her one servant. The latter had neither seen nor heard anything unusual. This, though the first, was by no means the last time the ghostly visitant appeared. Indeed, so familiar at length did both Mr. and Mrs. C become with the phantom that they grew to regard it with indifference. The manifestation was always the same. The gray-clad figure appeared within the dining room door, moved slowly across the room, paused for a second by the mantelpiece, turned back again, and vanished out of sight. Time passed on, circumstances caused the removal of Mr. and Mrs. C to another part of the country, and the ghost story of their early home, for which no explanation had ever been found, became a mere memory. It was after a lapse of several years that they chanced to be spending their summer holiday one year in Scotland. At a much frequented hotel, they made the acquaintance of Mr. and Mrs. H, a lady and gentleman traveling like themselves for pleasure. Drawn together by a community of interests, the C's and their new friends soon grew intimate. Items of personal history were interchanged until one day, Mrs. H, referring to some period of her past life, casually remarked to Mrs. C, that she and her husband were at that time living in a house which proved to be haunted. Further inquiries elicited the fact that, by an extraordinary coincidence, the couple had not only lived in the Cheshire village where had been Mr. and Mrs. C's early home, but that they had actually occupied the identical house tenanted by the latter at a subsequent date, and that they also had seen, without the possibility of self-deception, the apparition of the little man in gray which had first appeared to Mrs. C. There was this difference, however, in the sequel. Mrs. H. was so terrified and unnerved by the inexplicable occurrence that she and her husband left the place almost immediately. Now here were two sets of people, strangers to each other until thrown into chance companionship at a summer resort, who had at different periods lived in the same house and could therefore prove by absolutely independent testimony that the supernatural manifestation each had witnessed was not a delusion. Why that particular house, modern, commonplace as it was in every respect, should have been haunted, and whose was the apparition that in such strange fashion became visible to mortal eyes, others more learned in psychical research may possibly determine. not the least extraordinary of the strange happenings that appear to connect the seen with the unseen world, are those curious premonitions of impending or of actual disaster that are sometimes experienced by people, of which numberless instances supported by irrefutable evidence might be related. The following perfectly true story may serve as an instance. Mrs. E was the daughter of a British merchant resident in Valparaiso. Married when a mere girl, to a merchant captain commanding his own vessel, it had been arranged that as her husband's frequent voyages would leave her much alone, she should still continue to make her home under the paternal roof. Captain E was devoted to his young wife and to the little son who came to complete their happiness. Although a thorough sailor, 
he was never so happy as when enjoying her society during the brief intervals he spent on shore. They had been married about three years, when the captain was obliged to make a coasting trip from which he expected to return within a month or two. One afternoon, not more than a week or so before the ship was due at Valparaiso, Mrs. E's elder and unmarried sister, Miss T, was entertaining a friend in a room on the ground floor of the house, Mrs. E being at the time alone in the nursery on the floor above with her baby boy, whose nurse had gone out. Suddenly a knock was heard on the sitting room door. Miss T naturally called out, come in. No one entered, but the knock was repeated, both friends hearing it distinctly, and then as it seemed to them, footsteps were heard ascending the stairs. Miss T, wondering who the mysterious visitor could be, hurried to the door and opened it to find no one there. At the same moment, she heard her sister scream as if hurt or alarmed. She rushed upstairs and found Mrs. E in a state of violent agitation bordering on hysterics. It was some time before Miss T could soothe her sufficiently to obtain a coherent explanation of the cause. It then transpired that Mrs. E had also heard, as she believed, a knock on the nursery door, had exclaimed, come in, but no one appeared although she was instantaneously impressed with the conviction that some person beside herself was in the room. And oh, Barbarita, she added, I felt all at once as if somebody had taken a bucket of cold water and thrown it over me, or as if a great wave had struck me, and I was drenched from head to foot. In confirmation of the speaker's statement, her teeth chattered and convulsive shudders shook her frame. The entire circumstance was so extraordinary and so inexplicable that Miss T, having at length succeeded in restoring her sister to composure, went back to her friend, and together they noted down the exact hour at which it had occurred. It was not until the following day, the sad news was received of Captain E's death by drowning in the harbor of a port on the northern coast of Chile, through the capsizing of a small boat in which he was being conveyed from the shore to his own ship. He was an expert swimmer, but it was inferred that he must have been in some way stunned as he sank at once. His body was afterwards recovered when it was found that his watch had stopped at the identical time at which his sister-in-law heard the mysterious knocking and his wife experienced the strange sensation she so graphically described. Is it too much to believe that the spirit of the drowning sailor had come at the moment of its passage from life to death to take a last farewell of the being who had been dearest to him on earth? Among all the varied aspects of supernormal phenomena, there is probably not one that has awakened deeper interest in thoughtful minds than the possibility of a promise made by the living being kept when death has intervened. As an illustration of such a case, the following true incident is worth relating. A few friends were one day discussing the subject of spirit communication with the material world. Opinions were sharply divided. At length, one of the party closed the conversation with the remark, Well, if I should die first, I promise faithfully that if it is permitted me to make some manifestation to you, I shall do it. The words were uttered gravely with no hint of levity or trifling. The speaker, Mr. R., was a man in the prime of life. His hearers included his wife and two intimate friends, the Mrs. M. It so happened that these ladies were spending the following Christmas with relatives in a North Lancashire town. The R's were wintering in the south of England. On the morning of Christmas Eve, the younger sister, Miss H. M., was going after breakfast to her bedroom, the door of which facing the staircase was half open, the room being well lighted by a window on the other side. As she approached, with merely a narrow landing between, she saw distinctly a figure pass across the open space, but so quickly that she received no accurate impression as to who or what it was. Taking for granted, however, that probably it was a servant engaged in ordinary domestic duties, she entered the room, addressing a remark as she did so to the supposed housemaid. To her surprise and bewilderment, the room was unoccupied. It seemed incomprehensible, so completely convinced was she of having seen some person pass between the window and the half-open door. At that moment, her sister came into the room. To her, Miss H.M. related the circumstance, adding, I do believe I have seen a ghost. The sisters talked the matter over, not, however, for a moment, connecting it with their friends, the R's, from whom they had within a day or two previously received Christmas greetings. 
What then was their consternation and grief when, late on the afternoon of the same day, a telegram reached them from Mrs. R., announcing her husband's death, which had taken place that very morning between 9 and 10 o'clock, about the exact time when Miss H. M. had seen the mysterious figure. From later and more detailed news, it transpired that Mr. R. had undergone an operation for appendicitis. At first, all went well. Then came a sudden and unexpected change for the worse. And, as already stated, he passed away on the morning of Christmas Eve. It had been by his express desire that no hint of his malady and of the impending operation had been given to any friends. Hence, the Mrs. M. were in utter ignorance of the fact, and it was not until the first shock of the painful intelligence had subsided that they recalled with a feeling akin to awe the solemn promise made to them by their departed friend. Was it possible that promise had been redeemed?